Today we're going to uh, study, we'll continue our study with the parables. And uh, for that, we're going to go to Luke chapter 6. This parable is also found in Matthew chapter 7, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, both in uh, Matthew, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount, and this is also the Sermon on the Mount, but in Luke, we don't see a mount. When Luke, uh, when Luke records this, we see a flat, not a mount necessarily, meaning a place of gathering where they were. So we have a little bit of a difference in the approach, but uh, based, uh, where we are in chapter 6, I'll give you a little bit of a, a cohesiveness, uh, a bit of a, a context to where we are in chapter 6. <clears throat> we see the Beatitudes in chapter 5 of Matthew. You know that. Yes. Blessed are the poor in spirit and so on. In Matthew uh, 5, we now in Luke 6, we have the same Beatitudes starting in chapter uh, 6, verse 20. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. You got that? So this is the context. The Beatitudes that Jesus is talking about or sharing with the people are the same Beatitudes here where now, uh, then he goes on. He says, you have heard if you, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, if you hate somebody, it's the same as if you've killed somebody. You'll find that in verses 27 to verse 36, that an entire passage. Are you with me? This is the context we're setting up of what happened here and where Jesus is talking to the people. So in verse 37, just before the parable, Jesus says in verse 37, what? Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I'm going to stop here for just a moment and think on these verses before we jump into the actual parable. Do not judge that you not be judged. I'm going to come back to that once we get into the parable. We'll continue from that. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It is this part we want to stop for just a moment. It's verse 38. This is a command of Jesus to tell his followers to do what? To give. The Bible also tells us it is better to give than to receive. receive. He says, give and it will be given to you. You know, in the world, we have different personalities and different kinds of people. We have those that give and take. And they have the expectation that if they're going to give, they better get back. Now, I don't know why the British started this terminology or the phrase they call Indian giver. Indian giver. You know what that means? It's a common term, Indian giver. It's referred to those people that give with the expectation of giving back. In the Indian culture, when there are weddings and when there are celebrations, you give a gift and you measure that gift and you assign and you decide that gift based on your relationship with the person or the family with whom to whom you're giving. If it's just somebody that's not that important or not that close, you give a pretty small gift. But then if it's a family that's close, you give a little bigger gift. And then you think, oh no, what are they going to think? And what are they expecting? And then we keep track, okay, they have three daughters that are getting married over the years. So for the first daughter, we're going to give this much. And that family then writes it down. And for the second daughter, we give this much. So when it's time for your daughter to get married... And you only have two daughters, but they had three daughters. 
What do they do? They take the three and divide it by two, right? Because they're going to return it. But what do they do? They add one extra to it, one rupee. So if you give a hundred rupees, they give you what? A hundred and one. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah. Why? Because we give with the full expectation of? That is why they call that Indian giving. Because when we give, we have the full expectation of getting back and a little bit more. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, he says. A good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. I'll tell you what that's talking about. When people used to go for, to buy flour for their cooking, the shopkeeper would take, let's say, a container and pour the flour into it as loosely as possible so the container is full. So if it's one liter, for argument's sake, the bag is one liter, so you got a liter. But you know that the flour has room to be shaken so it settles down and pressed down more so you can get more into it. But the shopkeeper is not going to do that. What's he going to do? For you younger people who have not had the privilege to observe or know what shopping in India is about, when they weigh something, they have a weigh scale, and usually the weigh scale is, uh, is messed around with. In the old days, they used to have these little metal uh, weights, which said a quarter pound, half a pound, one pound, or kg actually. But some of those rascals used to make and hollow those things out. They used to hollow them out. So what looked like a half a kg was really less than a half a kg. And there in the scales they put the thing that looks like a half a kg and then measure on the other side what's supposed to be a half a kg, but it really wasn't a half a kg. And if, they, if you're not fast enough, they're so quick with a finger they just do this. And it looks like, oh, it's, 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 yeah, right, okay, thank you, go, away you go. That's what he's talking about. And then he says, in your lap what they used to do well, under their overcoat, they had a, uh, a way to wrap a bag a, some, that they had kind of a pocket. And in that pocket, they would buy their groceries or whatever, move their outer coat, put it in their bag in the deep pockets, and put the overcoat on, and they'd be going home having purchased the goods that they needed. So, Jesus knows all this. He's saying, now... Give and it will be given you. How much, is it, how much do want, does he want you to give? A good measure. A good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. So it's poured out into your lap. So it is so full. That bag is so full. That when you put it into your bag here in your pocket that's in your lap. It's actually flowing into your pocket. When we work so hard and money comes not easily and we have to part with it, we don't look to see whether we should share that money with the poor or with, or with God's work. We don't take the same spirit. What do we do? What's the least that I can get away with? We take and hollow out those weights. How much are other people giving? That's all I need to do. If the others in church are only giving this much, then maybe I only need to give this much. Nobody really knows, nobody really counts, nobody really notices. But, God notices because he tells us. In 1994-95, I wrote an article about various churches and what type of giving you can experience in certain churches compared to others. And we discovered from that research, and I contacted every conference in the North American division for that research. 
Well, we discovered that the churches that were traditional churches were those that had the best record for giving because they studied God's word and they had a relationship with God. Those churches that are, quote, celebration type of churches, lots of singing, lots of emotion, all feel happy, go home feeling happy, but when it comes to sharing what God gave you, no, God's going to give you your blessing in your time. Just wait. It's important that when we expect from God, and here we're not talking about salvation, uh, we're not talking about earthly things, we're talking about salvation. When we expect salvation, God examines our heart, absolutely. And the best, the best indicator of my heart is how deep into my pocket do I dig for the work of God. Not all the words I say, not all the things that I can talk about, but really what comes down to it. What part of my life do I really want to share with God and with those around me? The Bible says, what are the greatest laws? Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your fellow man as your self. That is shown by what we can do to dig into our own budgets, not leftovers, not things that won't get noticed, but those things that will hurt me that I may be able to give. It'll be painful. When giving becomes painful, it becomes a sacrifice. Why? If it's not painful, it's not a sacrifice at all. What are you sacrificing? Nothing. This is the attitude of the heart that God looks for. And this is the preamble to the parable for today. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher. Why do you look at the speck or sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Can, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You hypocrite! How can the student be above the teacher but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher? Why do you look at the speck or the sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Do you know what a plank is? What is a plank? You know, I like working with wood. I don't do it as much as I used to. I injured my hand or had this failed surgery so I can hardly hold a hammer and... Uh, don't want to risk the saws, but I love working with wood. You come to my house, I still have lots of two by tens, 10 feet long and 12 feet long and eight feet long. And the smell of the wood is so great. But those planks are big and they are heavy. When you cut those planks, out of the planks comes what? Sawdust, sawdust. If you ever get a piece of sawdust in your eye, your eye begins to water immediately. You kind of do it like this, even though you're not supposed to rub your eye, you kind of do this, you're trying. It gets watery, and the water takes out the sawdust in your eye. When it says that you got a plank in your eye, a, never mind a two by ten that's eight feet long, a plank that's two feet long in my eye. If I had a plank in my eye, I'd be as good as dead. But I don't see it. I don't see it. Why? Because I'm too busy 
looking at the sawdust, that little tiny thing that doesn't matter. In the life of my brother, I pick on him, I pick on him, I pick on him, and tell him, listen dude, let me show you the way. Let me show you the way. How in the world are you going to show your brother the way? How are you going to help him with the sawdust in your eye? One little bit of sawdust in your eye. When you got a two by ten in your own eye. How are you going to do it? Do you go to south? Let me go to Psalm 32 today, today's favored psalm. It was favored because it was read earlier in Sabbath school. It was referred to by our elder of the day. And now we're going to go to it again. This is David. Was David a man who had a piece of sawdust in his eye? Or was David a guy who had a blank in his eye? David's sin was great, was great, great before the Lord. And yet, here's what he writes. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are what? Covered. Covered, Covered by what? Covered by himself? If David covered his sins, could he be forgiven? No. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Covered by what? Covered by death, by the sacrifice. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. There's honesty that I am a sinner. There is no deception that I'm holy. When I kept silent, meaning when I did not confess, when I didn't want to talk about my sinfulness, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I did what? I acknowledged my sin to you. And did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Confessing the sin. Confessing the sin. Made him what? Righteous. Confessing the sin made David righteous. In Psalm 23 he says what? Read Psalm 23 verse 1. Sing joyfully to The Lord, you righteous. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Now he's upright. Now he's praising God because he's righteous. Why? Because he came to the recognition and confession of his sin. Without that recognition, without the confession of sin, there is no salvation. There is no righteousness. It comes only from the confession by the grace of God through faith. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with how many ways? All my ways. God knows everything about you and me. There are two good parts of that. One, God knows my life. He knows my sin. When I acknowledge my sin, He is waiting to respond. More importantly, let's go back and extract from Luke chapter 6 what that means. Go back to Luke chapter 6. Why do you look at the speck in the eye of your brother? 
and not pay attention to the plank in your own. The preamble for this parable starts with verse 37. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Why does God tell us not to judge? By the way, this doesn't mean that we ought not to judge in anything. God requires the body of Christ. God requires the organized church to judge its leaders, to judge its members. This is not what it's talking about. This is talking about a personal judgment against another person. Judge not and you will not be judged. And you judge not that you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. This last week, once again, confession. I was in downtown Oshawa. Busy time. I was in a hurry to get into City Hall. I had to submit some papers, an application for a building permit. And there in all this traffic, I was behind a van. And everybody else was going at a good rate of speed and this van is just barely moving and I'm thinking like, why doesn't this person just move over or stop or drive off or do something? Because I needed to turn right. So I had to be in the right lane. I'm thinking, what? what's wrong with this person? I was so angry. I couldn't help myself and just before I, 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 I got to the, to the turn, I just got so angry and I honked the horn. Not once, not twice. The Jews' maximum is three times, but I'm Indian, so I did it four times. I honk the horn at this person. Then what is wrong with you? Drive, drive, drive. And just then, that van turned in the same road that I had to turn on. And as the van turned, I could see in before the van were three people on bicycles who are riding their bikes so slow. And the van couldn't do anything except be stuck behind me. And as I turned to the right and the van turned to the right, at the next light the van is right beside me and I kind of looked at the van and I thought, oh no. I rolled my window down, I waved at them and I thought, I'm really sorry, I didn't see the bikes. And the lady looked at me like that and turned away. We're so quick to judge. Not knowing and understanding fully the consequences in which the other person is. We're so quick. I'll tell you a story. I don't feel like stories. I have, uh, you know, I have love dogs. I've had seven German Shepherds. And the latest German Shepherd, Pontos, if you go on our Facebook page, you see all his pictures. It's the biggest German Shepherd dog I've ever seen. He's about 120 pounds. And German Shepherds are supposed to be about 80 pounds, a male. And uh, he's also, when I, when, when, I got, when I got him, he was six months old. And even at six months old, he was just a big guy. And the people that I bought it from, they had him on a leash. They brought him over. And when I went there, he wanted to, he wanted to eat me up. He wanted to bite me. He just said, really mean. No. And I have another German shepherd. If I, if I take this German shepherd, he's only six months old. He's going to kill the other one. And then what am I going to do? But the dog was so handsome. I took the dog. I bought the dog. And I found out that this dog is not going to be friendly to too many people. He wanted to just attack everybody. He was afraid of little kids. And he wanted to attack little kids. One day he welcomed our head deacon. <laughs> with a love bite. On his arm. And uh, our head deacon was kind enough to forgive the dog, I think. If he didn't, he can't take communion, you know. And 
I ended up finding out, I called the people back and did some research on the dog. Turned out the dog had grown up for six months in a tiny little backyard of a townhouse. Always tied up, always picked on by neighborhood kids that used to poke at him with brooms and beat him with little brooms, well, well regular brooms. He's afraid of a broom, he's afraid of sticks, afraid of kids, afraid of humans, because he was poorly treated. Anybody who doesn't know that dog would think he's a terrible dog, terrible dog. Now he's been with me over two years, never been on a leash, never been hurt. He's a transformed dog. He's a loving, he's a most loving German Shepherd I have ever had. And the witness to that is Beulah. She comes to my house, she'll, he'll jump up on the couch and lay down with his head in his lap. Not too long ago, he met uh, Vinoy, and, uh, Vinoy and Vivid. And guess what? Immediately, they were friends. No problem with the dog. That same dog, that's evil, that's biting, that misbehaving. If you don't know how he became like that, we can't understand him. Can't understand him. God says, do not judge that you may not be judged. God is a fair judge. Because he knows where you've been. He knows why you behave the way you do. He knows that you bite people when you shouldn't. And when people that you bite, when they get angry at you because, you don't, because they don't understand you, he understands. I had a tenant. I could tell from the way he talked that he came from a good home. The way he behaved, you could tell that he had good parents. But there were some behavioral problems. He would pick a fight very quickly, didn't make friends was stealing, I gave him a job to help with construction. He's a certified framer, union carpenter. Then I met his parents. This young man at the age of two or three, they discovered, had a very, very severe skin problem. And because of his skin problem, he grew up in school where nobody wanted to be his friend. Nobody. Grew up with no friends. As he got a bit older, he became friends with some people who accepted him, but who were also considered rejects, I suppose. Kids that were involved in taking drugs, various kinds of drugs. He became addicted to drugs. To support his drug habit, he ended up stealing. Stealing from me. I'd buy tools and I'd get a report. Yeah, I'd get a report from me. Oh, Pagey, such and such tool got stolen. Oh, really? It did get stolen by him. And he'd go to the uh, secondhand stores and sell them to supply his needs. But I kept him employed. I kept him there. Others would say, why do you keep him? Doesn't matter. I knew his parents. I knew his story. Nobody else, not the other workers, not the other tenants, they didn't know his story. But I did. Kept him for two and a half years. And then, this year, I suggested to his parents that they move him out of that city and put him in a place where he had no access to drugs and people 
who would carry the drugs, so they moved them to the country. Nobody understood him, like his mother understood him. He got angry at his father, ended up in jail for beating up his father. But his mother understood him. Thank God I understood him. The last thing that he did that I suggested that they move him was we had tenants moving into a building. He went in to do some repairs, stole two telephones, stole some electronic equipment. I called his mother and said, uh, your son was home for the weekend. Did you happen to notice he had any extra money? Yeah, he did. Oh, by the way, Paigey, can you tell him that he forgot his phone over here in my car? I said, can you send me a photo of the phone? She did. It was a stolen phone. We got the phone back. Gave it to the people. I paid for the other equipment that he stole. And I said to his mother that there's no more help that I can give him. And nobody can do anything for him. He needs to get away from this. Why do I tell you that story? People that don't know him. Easily. People who are in that kind of lifestyle also become very violent very quickly. People in that lifestyle have no trouble beating up somebody, hurting somebody who does the kinds of things that this young man was doing. But nobody understood him. Nobody knew where he came from. And it's easy for us to look down on him. It's easy for others to look down and say, what a terrible guy. Why does he do this? Look at him, look at him, look at him, look at him, look at him. But we need to stop for just a little while. Why is he the way he is? Don't judge. Here's what happens when we judge. When I know that I can look at this person or that person and I know that they're bad, what does that do to me? It raises my value and the value of my righteousness. That person is doing wrong. That person is evil. That person is not as good as me. I follow all these things. That person doesn't follow all these things. What does it do to me? It takes me up and lifts me up in my own eyes to the point that I forget the humility. I'm devoid of a recognition of my own wrong. And when I cannot see my wrong, I cannot go to confession. Therefore, the judgment of others is a roadblock in my own salvation. That's why Jesus said, don't judge others. He knows what he's going to do with the others. So if I sit here and judge Jubin, that's what God's going to look after Jubin. So my judging Jubin is not going to affect Jubin or his salvation. Why? Because his salvation is to do with God. So why does God tell me to stop judging him? Not because of his salvation, but because of mine. Because of mine. He may not even care about my opinion. He may not even care that I judge him. It doesn't matter. But what matters is that I stop. I put a roadblock in my own salvation. Why? Because me looking down on him makes me feel I'm pretty good. Why? Because I'm part of the remnant. There's a... On Facebook... There are so many different discussion groups. There's one, some friends from India when I was a little kid, still there, they've got the Southern Asia Seventh-day Adventist uh, Facebook page. And somebody made a uh, comment about the remnant just to create discussion. I asked the question, what is it that makes us the remnant? And the answers came, boom, 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 boom. Then I said, please explain it. Try to get an understanding or try to get them to understand what that means to be a remnant. 
And the consistent answer comes out. Because compared to others, we are the one who keep the commandments. Collectively, we are required. We are required to examine the doctrines and the teachings. No doubt about it, we are. But why not take that on a personal level and look down on those That may be different, and not yet where I am. I cause a problem with my own salvation. This parable is not that Jesus is being a bodyguard for the person being judged. Not at all. That is a misunderstanding of this parable. This parable is that Jesus is protecting and being the bodyguard of the person doing the judging. He's talking to his own. Don't judge, he says. Why? Because you need to be like David. You need to be like David. That don't depend on your own righteousness. Confess your sins. Make sure your sins are covered. You're not that your sins are covered by the sins of your neighbor. That my sins are bad, but his are worse. Going back to Psalm 139. God, you have known me. You have known me. You know my sitting and my standing. You know everything about me. That passage finishes off by saying, even if I make my bed in hell, you are there. Do you know what that means? To make my bed in hell. Even if I end up being completely evil. Even if I end up being completely evil. Even there you are there to protect me and pull me out of it. You know why? Because he knows how I got there. He knows when I was formed in the womb of a mother. From then on he knows everything about me. Therefore when I go to him forgiveness and say God I can't help it. I'm on drugs. And those drugs are in my veins. And because I'm dependent on the drugs, when I look down on that druggie and say, you're a useless piece of garbage. That is our attitude. God says, no, 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 no. I know how he got there. I know how he got there. The good news is, God knows the same thing about us. No matter how we dress ourselves as righteous, no matter how fancy we look on the outside, no matter how righteous words we speak, no matter how well we think we know the Word of God, God knows what's in our heart. God knows. That is why in preparation in this parable, in preparation in this parable for an examination, He says, you really want to examine yourself? Then give, and it will be given you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, poured into your lap. You want to measure? You want to judge? Judge yourself. Because it is a judging of ourselves that brings us salvation. Not the judging of others. Not the judging of others. I have a, let's call it dual life. One, I trained to be a pastor. I ended up in business. Business is a tough world. And the business that we are engaged in now with the type of people that we deal with is not an easy life. But I deal with that all week long, and those people all week long. Yesterday, I had a conversation with somebody who hasn't paid rent. And I said to him, listen, as of the end of this month, you're going to have to pay rent or move out. This person happens to be an industrial tenant, not a residential tenant. And with industrial tenants, you can basically just lock the door. You don't have to go to any trial or anything. So I said, if you're not gone, 
If you don't want to be here, then let me know now so I can make decisions. The guy started to yell and scream and shout. And all the bad words that even I don't use. He ended up yelling and screaming and shouting and use what? Who do you think you are? I'm going to burn your house down. I'm going to come to your farm and bury you, he says. Problem is, this guy has a long record of assault. He's uh, had to go to jail for being in fights. He had to go for anger management classes. And he's got a big record with the police. So I said to him, do you really want to talk to me like that? What do you mean? I said, you shouldn't be saying those things. Get yourself in big trouble. Now I have to think about what am I going to do with this guy? What am I going to do with him? I can look at him and I can say, oh, this guy's had a hard life. This is how he grew up. This is what he knows. There is a difference in the spiritual law and the civil law. When God says that you don't judge, he's not talking about judging as a body of Christ. He's not talking about judging and breaking civil law because God is clear. If somebody kills, they have to pay for it. If somebody steals, they have to pay for it. This is talking about spiritual love on a personal basis. You are not to be confused. Just as we are called to be gentle and loving and forgiving and giving and understanding in our spiritual lives, in our daily lives, in our personal lives, God wants us to judge ourselves first. He doesn't tell us not to judge at all. That's not, the, that's not what this says. That's why I'm telling the story, the last story. Because the Bible doesn't tell you to do that. You're required to judge. But when our judging brings us to a point where our salvation is at stake, then, then we have a problem. It's my prayer that God impresses on me to compare my life to his expectations. And believe me, I do, I have to. And I find myself short, wanting, every day. But I'm grateful that God has a path that I can go to him Say, dear God, I'm dealing with this. I'm suffering with this. I don't know how to deal with this. But I leave it in your hands. This does not give us permission to go on sinning as the Apostle Paul says. But we go on back to God over and over and over again. Amen. Asking that he may accept us into his presence. Covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ through my own submission to him and admission of sin. God bless us as we continue to study his word.